gives me uh, an enormous amount of pleasure um, to, to be introducing uh, Susan Marshall uh, to you this evening, um, talking on a subject that is uh, dear to my heart, um, given my long distant um, connections with the, the Lordship of Galloway um, back in the, the 1980s. Um, but, but Susan is taking it on to a, a new level, um, shall we say. Um, for those of you who don't know um, Susan, she's um, currently an honorary uh, teaching fellow at the University of Aberdeen um, and is actually a product of the University of Aberdeen, having done her MA, MLIT and PhD um, at, at the university, completing um, her PhD um, on uh, illegitimacy in medieval Scotland, 1165 to, to 1500 uh, in 2013. Um, and since then has uh, turned that into a Scottish Historical Review monograph um, on illegitimacy in Scotland 1100 to 1500. Um, and, and I thoroughly recommend um, looking at both the, the pieces when you can and, and the, the book, which is the, the, the product of it. Um, so this evening, um, Susan is going to be talking specifically um, on the subject, get the title absolutely right here, um, one Lord Rather Than Many, Bastardy and Secession in Medieval Galloway. So Susan, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Um, and I'd like to thank also uh, Professor Claire Downham for inviting me to give tonight's talk. Um, Chris, could I have the, the slides up for thanks? Okay. Um, so... Um, can we move on to the, the next slide? Thanks, Chris. So, um, since the Scottish Society for Northern Studies exists to encourage exploration of the interactions and influences of, let me get this right, Scandinavian, Celtic and Scottish worlds, uh, I'm going to be talking tonight about Galloway, a region that in the Middle Ages was by virtue of its location and of the family which ruled over it, highly important to those interactions. Now, some of you um, may already know about the family concerned and about the conflict which arose when um, concerning the men of Galloway's desire to have one member of that family, Thomas, as Lord of Galloway, a desire that was fiercely opposed by the then King of Scots, Alexander II. Now, Thomas was the only known son of Alan, Lord of Galloway, but he was not the son of any of Alan's three wives, three known wives, and it seems he wasn't the son of some unknown wife either, as his contemporaries appear never to have thought he was anything other than illegitimate, or in other words, a bastard. Bastardy was a legal category, and it had the same definition then as it does now. A bastard was someone whose parents were not married to each other at the time of his or her birth. Um, now, the definition of bastardy may have endured across the centuries, but the meaning of bastardy has fluctuated a great deal. Um, in modern times, bastardy is no longer a word used in legal parlance. In law, or at least Scottish law, children nowadays are marital or non-marital. And both categories have the same rights in respect of inheritance from their parents. Very few people nowadays would think that the rights of someone born out of wedlock should be different from the rights of their contemporaries born of married couples. And for modern Britons, denying someone inheritance rights on that basis smacks too much of punishing someone unfairly. But some people in the audience tonight will remember a time, in the not too distant past in fact, when illegitimate people could not be heirs. And for people of my generation and many earlier generations, our view of illegitimacy was coloured by the tremendous opprobrium attached to it by established authorities and society in general. At the same time, while recognising that stigma was strongly associated with the condition of illegitimacy, most of us at least would not judge a person based on his or her birth circumstances, but would take them instead as we found them in the same way we would anyone else. But the meaning of bastardy for that person lay in how it affected their lived experience 
knowing that they couldn't inherit, knowing that for public authorities and perhaps others, they were viewed as objects of disgrace or shame, living in communities where neighbours and associates might look at them a little differently. But this evening we're talking about almost 800 years ago when the situation was different again. The meaning assigned to Thomas of Galloway's illegitimacy by the men of Galloway was not the same as the meaning assigned to it by Alexander II or by the law which Alexander sought to enforce. Laws, of course, don't just spring out of nowhere. And so to understand what happened in Galloway, we're going to look at the law as regards bastardy and succession as it stood then. So next slide, please. Um, there were two main legal systems in operation in medieval Scotland, with each having its own field of jurisdiction. Church law, that is canon law, had jurisdiction over not just the management and discipline of the institutional church and its employees and practitioners, but over some aspects of the moral life of the populace, within which marriage was an increasingly significant element. In the early Middle Ages, and to some extent throughout the medieval era, in Scotland as elsewhere, marriage was essentially a contract between two families by which the son of one and the daughter of the other were joined in matrimony with the intention of each family benefiting in some way from the match. As might be inferred from that description, it was usual for the parents to be the prime movers in deciding on an appropriate spouse for their offspring. And marriage was a fairly business-like affair. What the church sought to do, and increasingly from the 11th century, uh, and did in fact eventually succeed in doing, was to gain control over marriage by reconceptualizing it as a theological concern, reflective of the union between Christ and the church, something with sacramental effect, and so imbued with a type of holiness. Its sacramental status meant it had implications for salvation. Marriage became a vocation, a way of life sanctioned by the church, and so requiring its participants to conform to the church's rules governing it. A union that didn't comply with the rules was not a valid marriage. Um, next slide, please. Now the church's model of marriage was exogamous, monogamous, permanent and voluntary. In other words, you couldn't marry anyone in your extended family. Uh, you, weren't in a, you weren't allowed to have other sexual partners. The grounds for divorce were extremely limited and the firm expectation was that you were married until you or your spouse died. And in theory at least, though it might not be uh, always very easy to enact, um, you couldn't be forced to marry someone against your will, however much your parents wanted the marriage to go ahead. Now, these rules were not all new in the 11th and 12th century, but they came to have more recognition and importance. And we even find them in English royal legislation. Um, can we have the, the next slide? Thanks. The law codes of Canute II echo church law very closely in that they seek to enforce the forbidden degrees of consanguinity and affinity as we call the rules concerning marriage to someone in your extended kin group or related to a former sexual partner or a godparent, and to make it unlawful to have additional sexual partners or to divorce or to coerce someone into an unwanted marriage. Now, Canute II was not king of Scots, of course, but the point is that Christian kings, wherever located, were expected to uphold the principles of Christian marriage in their kingdoms. And although church law and secular law formally had separate jurisdictions, there was necessarily an overlap in the ideas about morality, which informed both sets of laws. Now, of course, parents did carry on arranging their children's marriages and marriage contracts carried on, detailing the specifics of the wealth to be exchanged. But those arrangements sat alongside the church model of marriage, which came to be enshrined in canon law and upheld by consistory, that is, church courts, staffed by canon lawyers, which uh, came to be found in every diocese of Scotland by the end of the 13th century. 
One of the things they did was make rulings as to which unions were marriages and which not. And because marriage was under the legal purview of the church, the determination of who was and was not legitimate, because it depended on whether or not his or her parents were validly married according to canon law, was also under the jurisdiction of the church. Okay, next slide. Um, so here we see some conception and birth circumstances in which children were deemed by the church to be legitimate. The church exercised a presumption in favour of legitimacy consistent with its uh, stance on marriage. As long as the two parents were free to marry each other and did so in good faith, the children were legitimate. Because its own rules about what was and was not a valid marriage were such that it was relatively easy to fall foul of them and marry someone within the forbidden degrees, the church allowed that as long as at least one of the spouses was oblivious to the connection, perhaps having been deceived by the other spouse, the children were legitimate, though the couple were expected to obtain a papal dispensation, making the marriage lawful. In fact, the evidence of surviving dispensations indicates that although petitioners usually claimed that one or both parties to the marriage was ignorant of the impediment, uh, dispensations were also granted to couples who admitted they knew they were not allowed to do so, but had married anyway, and who sought forgiveness and absolution. And the point of these classifications was that they allowed for clarity in determining who was legitimate. If your circumstances fell into these groupings, you weren't a bastard. Next slide. But some children were. Um, some couples were free to marry, but didn't do so. Other parents were not free to marry at all. And according to the church's rules on sexual morality, neither group should have been procreating. And they should not and could not expect their children to enjoy the benefits of legitimacy. The point of these classifications was also to ensure clarity about status and additionally to provide some indication of how morally flawed an illegitimate person might be. All sex outside of marriage was sinful and a person who had been conceived in wrongful intercourse could not help, was the thinking, could not help but have a fault in their innate disposition, a stain on their character imparted by the wrongfulness of the act that had resulted in their birth. And since quite a number of illegitimate people pursued a career in the church, the classifications enabled it to identify those who needed careful watching or who might not be trusted with the cure of, cure of souls. Any candidate for ordination who was illegitimate needed a dispensation from the papacy, and once ordained, they needed additional dispensations for each new post they sought within the church hierarchy. Uh, next slide, Chris. In principle, the ease with which illegitimate people could obtain these dispensations stood in inverse proportion to the gravity of the sexual offence that had resulted in their birth. And explaining this, Aquinas pointed out that a man's good name is bedimmed by sinful origin. Um, and so dispensations were therefore, as Aquinas said, the more difficult to obtain according as their origin is the more discreditable. The more forbidden the parent's relationship, the more likely was the character of the offspring to be morally compromised. Those born of adultery or incest, or whose conception violated holy vows, were the most likely to have a bad character and be prone to vice, and we get glimpses in the papal records of how this sometimes worked in practice. Here's one here, um, somebody being, uh, his uh, promotion in the monastery being dependent on not being born of um, adultery or inc incest, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean um, parent and child or siblings. Um, it was classed as incest if it was anyone within uh, your kin group. Um, or indeed um, the kin group of someone you previously slept with. 
um, or indeed um, uh, the kin group of somebody who is your godfather or godmother. So 1234, the year in which Alan of Galloway died, was a significant year for marriage and legitimacy because it was a year that saw the, the dissemination of the canon law compilation known as the Liber Extra, also known as the Decretals of Pope Gregory IX. Next slide. It contained a much more detailed collection of material on marriage and on legitimacy that had been brought together before. Uh, almost a century earlier, in 1140, the compilation known as Gratian's Decretum had attempted to bring together many years worth of disparate canon law texts and legal decisions into a single collection, which sought to iron out the discrepancies and resolve the contradictions across them so that it could be used as a handbook of the law for canonists in the ecclesiastical courts and elsewhere. This was the same approach taken by the compilers of the Liber Extra, but in the intervening 93 years, the church had done a great deal to work out its theology and law of marriage and had also given much more thought to the marital or sexual circumstances resulting in legitimate versus illegitimate offspring. So although um, important tenets of marriage law were contained in the decreed immigration in the first half of the 12th century, it wasn't the final version of marriage law that came to be established, and Gratian didn't have that much to say about illegitimate children. He was concerned about the position of priest's sons, but not to any degree about that of illegitimates among the laity. Whereas the Liber Extra devoted a whole chapter to the subject. Um, next uh, slide, Chris, thanks. Um, a chapter called Which Children Are Legitimate? And the categories you saw in the hierarchy of legitimacy in an earlier slide are taken from the Liber Extra's rulings in this chapter. So what this tells us is that for much of the 12th century and into the 13th, the church was still developing the legal framework around marriage and legitimacy. For example, it's not until the late 12th century that we have the decretal that says children born before their parents marry each other are legitimated by the marriage. But having a fully worked out doctrine is one thing and getting people to accept and comply with it is another. And the church was not always able to impose its will on the population of a country in the way that it would like. From its earliest days, the church sought to eradicate customs and traditions it considered ungodly and replace them with behaviours and practices consistent with Christian teaching. In some arenas, they were very successful, while in others, the best they could hope for was a partial victory. But in either case, societies might take years and even generations to change. For example, the church outlawed trial by combat in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council, but we continue to see evidence of it in Scotland and various other parts of Europe much later than that. There's a famous example of two litigants in Scotland, both belonging to noble families, who are in dispute over an inheritance in the 1360s and who are preparing for trial by combat and only stopped when the king intervened uh, to mediate a settlement. To take another and quite extreme example, the 12th century church law that said prenuptial children were legitimated by their parents' subsequent marriage, intermarriage was not accepted in England until the 20th century. And the church had spoken out against illegitimate men becoming kings from at least the 8th century. But some kingdoms in Western Christendom continued to recognize bastard born men as rightful heirs to the throne into the late Middle Ages. They included Tancred of Lecce, King of Sicily in the late 12th century, Fernando III of Castile, a 13th century king, and Joao I, King of Portugal from the late 14th century uh, into the 15th. Um, next slide, please. And Sarah MacDougall, uh, who's made a special study of royal bastards in medieval Europe, 
points out that numerous marriages among European royalty up to and including the 12th century were invalid on grounds of consanguinity and no dispensation was sought for most of them, but there was no question of descendants of these unions being excluded from succession. Similarly, in the great cause, the adjudication as to who would become King of Scotland after Alexander III died, most claimants to the throne descended from earlier generations of illegitimate royal offspring were immediately excluded. However, the legitimacy of some ancestors of other candidates is open to question, but seems not to have been taken into account. And of course, the population of any given country is rarely homogenous, but made up of societies which differ according to their geographical region and the particularities of their local history and cultural influences. So even where it can be said that a particular kingdom accepted and implemented some aspect of church law, there may still be parts of that country in which compliance was half-hearted or largely absent. So uh, marriage and legitimacy were under the jurisdiction of the church, but critically, inheritance was not. Inheritance was a matter for secular jurisdiction, for royal or common law, but just as the church might not be wholly successful in having its laws, especially new laws, readily accepted across an entire country, so, do, so too did royal legal authority sometimes take time and practical enforcement measures to be embedded in society. Localised customs and traditions for dealing with disputes were enacted by people recognised within a community as its leaders, and even after royal authority in the form of sheriffs and the formal infrastructure of courts was established, some vestiges of older practices might survive. By the start of the 13th century, Scotland, um, or at least parts of it, is in some ways a Normanized country. The crown is uh, certainly Normanized. In the 12th century, there's evidence of some grumbling about how French the kings Malcolm IV and William the Lion are, with some Scots viewing them as outside the traditional culture of Celtic Scotland. One of the manifestations of the change in culture is that legitimate primogeniture, that is inheritance by the eldest son born in marriage, and if there are no sons, then legitimate daughters uh, obtain the inheritance, is starting to gain predominance over much older traditions concerning heirs being chosen on the grounds of some other characteristic, such as personal ability or the status of the mother. Eldest sons were usually or often their father's heirs, and in many cases there was no conflict between the two systems. But the 13th century saw any room for flexibility being eroded. The reign of Alexander II, which began in 1214, is notable for its developments in legal matters, not just in new and refined laws, but in the introduction of legal instruments and the processes to administer them and in the reach and enforcement of the king's law at the expense of localised arrangements for maintaining order. In 1213, before he was king, the young Alexander took part in an arbitration which had been brought to his father, William the Lion. An earl by the name of Morris had his right to the earldom of Menteith challenged by his younger brother, also called Morris. Eldest sons were frequently the rightful heirs, and indeed the elder Morris was already in possession of the earldom. But William and Alexander awarded the estate to the younger Morris. The explanation for their decision is not recorded, but the likeliest reason is that the older Morris was illegitimate, born of a liaison his father had before he married, and the younger Morris was legitimate, the product of their father's marriage to his mother. And in the changing legal climate of the 13th century, we see um, an increasing willingness by litigants to challenge inheritances on grounds of bastardy. And part of this, I would suggest, comes from the fact that there was a much clearer idea of who was and was not legitimate based on the much more detailed and worked out canon law 
concerning what was and was not a marriage and the circumstances in which offspring could be said to be legitimate. These legal challenges to inheritance, bastardy dis disputes, often involve both legal jurisdictions. Once an allegation of bastardy was made, the matter was passed to the church lawyers for a decision as to whether the putative heir was or was not legitimate. Their findings would be sent to the sheriff and the inheritance awarded or not, according to the legitimacy or otherwise of the expected heir. Another aspect of Alexander II's reign was that, like his father before him, he had to contend with repeated attempts by members of the MacWilliam kindred to claim the throne of Scotland. As we heard from Simon Egan in last month's lecture, the attacks by MacWilliam claimants and their supporters were launched from the north and the west, making Galloway a strategically important province in terms of that threat. Um, next slide, please, Chris. Um, a threat that continued until the last MacWilliam in the lineage, an infant girl, was publicly and brutally killed in 1230, just four years before Alan of Galloway's death. And ideas about illegitimacy and inheritance were highly pertinent to the Kings of Scots in their efforts to deny the claims of the MacWilliams, since the MacWilliams claim was based on their descent from Duncan II, the son of Malcolm III. Duncan had died in the late 11th century and started to be portrayed from the uh, early in the 12th century as illegitimate, making it appear that Duncan's line, that is the McWilliams, had no right to the throne in the first place. This is of course based on the uh, legal premise of legitimate birth being a prerequisite for inheritance, and especially of such a lofty inheritance as the throne, though the matter was much less clear cut in Duncan's own time. Now, historically, uh, Galloway was somewhat anomalous in Scotland. The lordship enjoyed a certain level of autonomy from the crown. It had its own laws and its own relationships with neighboring kingdoms. Galloway had a reputation, how well deserved is hard to say, as being a region in which marriage and family customs did not comply with the regulations or the principles which the church held up as being essential to the concept of a valid marriage. Um, we have a particular problem in discerning what was actually going on in Galloway as the descriptions of Gallovidian marriage practices that survive do so in English clerical writing and seem designed to accord with tropes concerning the supposed barbarity of the Scots, or at least the Scots in some parts of the kingdom. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, in the 12th century, Aylred of Rivaux made the claim that the people of Galloway were so inclined to um, abandon their spouses in pursuit of new amorous adventures that women in Galloway who changed their husbands only every month were considered chaste. The Lanarkost Chronicle includes a joke that the writer says was told to him by an unnamed 13th century Scottish knight concerning the people of a town in Annandale. So not Galloway, but fairly close. Um, Annandale is now part of the local authority region of Dumfries and Galloway. According to this, the local population was so promiscuous, he describes the men as drunkenly violating and seducing each other's wives and daughters, that the local archdeacon was making a fortune through collecting the church fines they had to pay for adultery and fornication. And the town landlord couldn't get his rents because the townspeople were too worn out by their illicit intercourse, as the chronicler puts it, to earn enough money to pay the landlord as well as the archdeacon. And although we might take these assessments of uh, Galloway with a, a sizable pinch of salt, it's quite possible that many people in Galloway did prefer their own long-standing customs as regards marriage and inheritance over the church model of marriage and over royal law regarding succession. <clears throat> 
If so, it may be explicable, at least in part, by Galloway's status as a semi-independent, essentially Gallic region with a strongly hybrid set of cultural influences, something that was exemplified in the person of Alan of Galloway. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Chris. <clears throat> so, Alan was simultaneously um, a Scoto-Norman aristocrat and the hereditary lord of a Celtic mini kingdom within a kingdom, as it's been called. Uh, he was constable of Scotland uh, and owned estates in England as well as Scotland. He was a kinsman of the English king and was an ally of William the Lion and then of Alexander II though at times pursued his own ambitions, even where doing so wasn't in the best interests of these other parties, uh, notably in his efforts to extend his authority into parts of Ulster, the Isle of Man and Cumbria. Alan's first wife was a daughter of the English nobility. His second wife was a niece of William the Lion and his third was the daughter of the Earl of Ulster. He was part of the political networks of all three kingdoms and was a supplier of military aid to their kings through the very considerable resources in terms of fighting men and galleys that he had at his disposal. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. The Diocese of Galloway was answerable to the church in York until the late 15th century, the only Scottish diocese to be subject to an English church authority after 1198. And the neighbouring diocese to the west, the Diocese of Sodor of Man, that is the Hebrides and the Isle of Man, was under the authority of the Norwegian church, as were Orkney and Shetland. The islands were at least nominally under the political rule of Norway until 1266, when Scotland acquired them through the Treaty of Perth. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so these two charts give an indication of the, uh, a part of the network of marriages. And so the joining together of families and lines of descent between the various groups and peoples in the part of the world we're talking about before and during the 13th century. And the whole region was an ethnic and cultural admixture of Scots, Gaels, Scandinavians, Anglo-Normans, others, and Alan of Galloway was a key figure in it. Now, did Alan intend his illegitimate son, Thomas, to inherit the lordship? Apparently not. He gifted Thomas uh, some lands in Galloway, which he probably wouldn't have done if he thought Thomas was going to be heir to the whole thing. Uh, and he arranged the marriage of Thomas to the daughter of King Longvalder of Man, suggesting he intended Thomas to be recognised in due course as King of Man, not Lord of Galloway. Thomas's illegitimacy seems not to have been regard regarded by Ron Valder as a barrier to marrying into the Manx royal line. Ron Valder was himself illegitimate and had become king despite his legitimate half-brother, Olafer, being the designated heir by their father. And it's worth noting here that Norway didn't have much of a problem with illegitimate men becoming kings. The historian Jenny Jochens has pointed out that between 1130 and 1240, 46 men presented themselves as candidates for the kingship of Norway, of whom only 12 or 13 were legitimate. Only five of the 24 men who did rule were legitimate according to the rules of the church. Next slide, please. But without a legitimate son to inherit the lordship, Galloway was subject to partible inherit <coughs> inheritance by Alan's legitimate daughters, two of whom were the daughters of Alexander II's cousin, Margaret of Huntingdon, <coughs> and, all th and, <coughs> and all three of whom were married to Anglo-Norman nobles. Partible inheritance by daughters in the absence of a son was not at all popular in medieval Scotland. And what we find later from the 14th century is the growth of what we now call mail tales, that is, tailies, legal documents de directing the destination of estates, which specify inheritance by male kin at the expense of female heirs where possible. <clears throat> 
uh, in the reign of Robert the Bruce, we have a tale ye directing the succession to the throne, which places the king's brother, Edward, ahead of the king's daughter, despite the fact that primogenitor, by which estates pass to offspring, not to collaterals, is well established by them. In 1234, there is no tale ye considering inheritance of Galloway, and so each of the three daughters is to receive a third of the estate. Now, the men of Galloway object very strongly to this. Um, their primary objection appears to have been the prospect of the Lordship of Galloway being split up into three lesser estates, which might in future be subdivided again if any of the inheritors had no sons, which would mean another round of partable inheritance among the daughters or daughter, splitting it up still further. Um, this had serious implications for the leading men of the Lordship, as had the loss of autonomy implied by having a decision about the heirship imposed on them. In 1235, their efforts to maintain hold of Galloway by insisting on Thomas's right to it break down into war with the king. Contemporary sources are mainly, though not wholly, consistent in saying that lordship by Thomas was proposed by the men of Galloway primarily to thwart partition of lordship. Uh, next slide, please. The Melrose Chronicle says that the Galwegians, preferring to have one lord rather than many, initially asked the king to assume the, lord, <coughs> the lordship in place of the sisters. And on his refusal, they became angry beyond measure. This is echoed in the Annals of Dunstable, which attribute the, the ensuing great slaughter to the fact that the people of the land refused to permit a division of the fief. Uh, next slide, please. Matthew Paris's account notes that the men of Galloway wanted the lordship to go to Alan's illegitimate son or to any one of various other family members, suggesting that it didn't much matter who, as long, presumably, as a single heir obtained it. Next slide. Scott Chronican records the reason for the rebellion as the Galwegians being extremely angry because they could not get the Lord King to agree that Alan's legitimate heirs should be disinherited and Thomas, his natural son, become the heir and their Lord. The Lanacos Chronicle doesn't mention partition. Uh, it does make it clear, however, that rejection of the legitimate heirs was significant. Um, but says that their motive was to withdraw from the king's authority. While keeping the lordship intact seems to have been more important to them than protection of native tradition in respect of succession, the willingness of the men of Galloway to move the dispute onto military footing does demonstrate that they didn't see illegitimacy as a fixed barrier to inheritance. Possibly what the Galwegians sought was the right to choose between long-standing local tradition and recently introduced practices, depending on which offered the more desirable outcome in a given situation. Matthew Paris adds a detail, uh, if we can have the next slide, thanks, which to him is an important aspect of the conflict. The men of Galloway, he says, in their efforts to free themselves from the authority of the king and restore the territory to the illegitimate Thomas, engaged in a certain, <clears throat> a certain mode of divination. Divination is, of course, forbidden by the church, as his readers and listeners would know, and took part in a ritual that was an abominable custom of their ancestors. Paris may be implying here that the ritual was one belonging to the pre-Christian forebears of the people of Galloway, but in any case, it was not, in Paris's view, something that should be happening in a Christian kingdom in the modern 13th century. And it marks out the Gallovidians as barbarians. Their enacting of this ritual is intimately connected to their determination to have Thomas as Lord of Galloway. And for Matthew Paris, <clears throat> this is nothing less than a direct provocation to the king and an invitation to war. Uh, 
So here we have another example of the trope of the barbaric Scots in English clerical writing. And what it does here is implicitly align illegitimate succession with barbarism. That may not be the main issue for Paris. I think for him, the fact that they rebelled against lawful and God-given royal authority is primarily what he finds deplorable. But there's no escaping the fact that in his account, the sort of people who want to see bastards inherit major estates are not Christians and not civilized, but essentially heathen savages. The upshot of the conflict was that Alexander II's forces defeated the Galwegians and Thomas wound up in the King's custody at Edinburgh and was later handed over to Dervorgala, one of his half-sisters, who had inherited a share of Galloway, and he remained a prisoner in Barnard Castle until he was very elderly. Now, <clears throat> the Galloway succession dispute was not a bastardy dispute in the usual sense of that term described earlier, a question mark over someone's legitimacy resulting in a legal process to determine whether or not they can inherit. In the case of Thomas, his illegitimacy was uncontested. The conflict is quite properly seen as a political struggle for royal authority over a region that had the potential to be too much of a loose cannon if left to its own devices. But I think there's an additional significance to it that's often under acknowledged, which is its importance in asserting and confirming <coughs> that illegitimate people should be excluded from inheritance. At a time when Scotland, in common with other European kingdoms, <coughs> excuse me, was changing from a society in which sons might inherit estates um, based on factors other than their legitimacy to one in which being born of a valid marriage was a prerequisite for inheritance. The Galloway succession dispute turned on whether or not a bastard who was recognized by his community as having a right to inherit could in fact do so. <coughs> in that sense, it was enormously significant because it sent a message to the people of Scotland that the king, the maker and adjudicator of the law, would not tolerate illegitimate inheritance. Any social change comes about through a combination of shifting attitudes, alterations to the legal landscape and individual cases that attract attention and debate with each of these factors feeding into the others. It wasn't the only high profile event concerning bastardy and succession in the 13th century, but it was certainly the most violent and it may well have had an important role to play in shaping attitudes to bastardy in the Scottish Middle Ages. That's me, thank you, that's me finished. Thank you very much, Susan. And uh, I hope you'll be willing to, to take um, some questions sure. uh, from, from the, uh, the audience, uh, if there are any that's come in. Um, so far, I've got one from um, Sangul Dujar, um, who's basically asking if you could give some more insight into you know, who the people classed as barbarian are and, and you know, what it is that they, you know, why they are classed. In, in this barbaric uh, manner by people like Paris? Uh, well, they're, they're only ever described as the men of Galloway. Um, so the, the leading men, the people who have some power and influence in the, um, uh, in the lordship, essentially, and their followers. Um, uh, and they're, they're painted as barbaric um, for uh, reasons to do with their rebellion, their refusal to go along with um, the, the king's uh, commands about um, what should happen to uh, the lordship after the death of Alan um, and all the usual reasons that um, English clerical writers have for uh, criticising um, uh, Scots or, or other people that they, they deem um, their enemies or, or problematic in some way. 
that. I've got a question here from uh, Bredenach. Um, it's asking, could the men of Galloway have been motivated to preserve their Gallic culture against incoming Norman French? So is, is this attempt to get Thomas more about, doesn't matter if he's illegitimate, it's all about preserving identity and culture? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. That was, uh, that, that, um, that's not, uh, it's, it's, it's possible, I think, but it's, it's not what comes over the strongest. What, what, what would you say, knowing Galloway better than anyone here? Oh, <laughs> well, that, that, that's a separate thesis. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I don't think we should see any longer um, th this traditional um, opposing polarization of yeah, you know yeah. you're either Gallic or you're uh, mm -hmm. Norman French um, and, and particularly by the middle of the 13th century there's already uh, an awful lot of hybridity not just at the level of the Lords of Galloway but percolating down through mm -hmm. the the men of Galloway in terms of their um, social leadership but so I'll just say it's maybe not quite as black and white as, as that kind of um, polar opposite. Uh, yeah approach. no I think it, yes I think it's an, an attractive idea that but it is a bit binary and um, uh, the the what the 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 influences that had penetrated the lordship by the, as you're saying the middle of the 13th century and, and before that were such that a uh, uh, it would be surprising to find um, to, to think that that could have been their only motivation. Yeah, and just uh, you know, one other thing I would add on that one is um, it's interesting in all of the debate in the the, the twelve thirty three to thirty five uh, period um, is the relative passivity, as it seems, of the church in Galloway. Okay, you've got an episcopal succession. Um, crisis there, but um, it's the church in Galloway doesn't seem to be taking any particular stand, as it were. Um, whereas you know they, they do have a very close relationship with the Lords of Galloway prior to that point. Um, they are regularly in contact with um, their metropolitan in York, so it's not that they're going to be ignorant of the changes in um, uh, legal thinking uh, on the matter. So. There, there, there's questions that, that spill out from this in a big way. Um, okay. Um, question. I mean, uh, um, Alex Maxwell Pindlater is saying yes, barbaric here is surely simply pejorative. Um, do you have a view on that? I think it's more, personally, I think it's more than just a pejorative. There is a, a cultural meaning in this. And I think the next question that we've got on the um, the list is, you know, more like the same logic as Orientalist versus Occidentalist or simply outsiders. Um, it, it, it's that negative view of somebody who is other. Um, yes, no, I, I, that's why I, I mentioned a, a couple of times about English clerical writing having a particular perspective on um, the Scots or uh, uh, certain areas of Scotland and, and you know the division between the Highlands and the Lowlands and so as well there's there's a tradition of um, uh, kind of attitudes there where um, certain groups are regarded as less civilized um, than, than others um, so uh, it's uh, no, I agree. It's, it's it's more more complex than simply being pejorative. There's a whole um, um, a whole kind of picture of uh, who they're dealing with, um, which uh, doesn't. Uh, it's just kind of symbolised by the word barbaric, um, but it it could mean all sorts of. It had all sorts of implications. Um, so I'm not explaining this. Uh, terribly well. If, if, if I could ask a question, uh, there's another one just popped in here, but if I could jump in, take your privilege on this one. Um, do you see in this any kinds of parallels with the way that, you know, in the um, later 12th century, you've got uh, Gerald of Wales uh, portraying um, Irish kingship and, and, and Irish rulers and their 
um, in that you call most barbarity. Um, and you know, on, on the other side, uh, if you look at the Chronicle of Man uh, and the way in which it presents the, the contrast between uh, Ronwald uh, on the one hand and his half brother um, Olaf uh, on the other, the people that Alan of Galloway is getting um, heavily involved with. This. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the way in which there, there is um, a particular portrayal um, emerging already um, before uh, Gregory the the, the ninth. Um, with... Oh yes, yes, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, no, no, definitely yes. Um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. There there are parallels there. There are um, attitudes that uh, are are there and forming. I mean, I'd probably well before the 12th century as well. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, so Alan James is asking, uh, there seems to be a great change in attitudes once Dervergilla achieved sole ladyship of Galloway. Uh, by the end of her life, she and her son and grandson were strongly supported uh, by the men of Galloway. Um, how, how do, do you can you explain that in in terms of um you know they, they've got this great opposition to what Devergilla represents um back in 1234-35 and yet um within 60 years um they're being held up as the protectors of Galloway identity and, and strong um attachment of the men of Galloway to to the Balliol lineage yeah but 60 years is quite a long time and they're mm very thoroughly, uh, I mean, their whole life is uh, is there and doing all the things um, that, that would be, you know, being the lordship of Galloway, being the lords of Galloway, even though, you know, nominally it's, uh, you know, the, the daughters weren't wanted. It's the, you know, they're perfectly uh, successful in, uh, embedding themselves and in doing the in running the the uh, uh, lordship successfully for the people um, who are there uh, I think I think it's just time really rather than anything else and mm -hmm. people's experience uh, yes, the, 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 the question of barbarity and identity seems to be um, uh, attracting a lot of attention here um, Alex uh, Maxwell Findlay has come back to you know, his real point is that um, the same men might easily be called uh, Les Bonjons if they agreed um, with the, the writer. Um, and, and Hector uh, raises the point um, from John Gillingham's uh, research, um, suggesting that barbarians were simply bearded peoples, unlike the higher civilization of clean shaven English kings uh, and clerics. It's exemplified in the famous story of the young king or Prince John going round laughing at them and pulling the beards um, of, of Irish kings of the late 12th century. Mm -hmm. uh, but Hector, do remember almost every single manuscript illustration we've got of uh, kings of England in this period has them as bearded. Um, so, but any view on that, Susan? Um, are, 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 are these just, and, and bear in mind, Chris Cooeyman, uh, who is managing our, um, uh, technical side of things as the exponent of uh, beardiness. Okay. <laughs> um, it's not something I've done a particular study. Uh, I, I, it's not something I've looked into in any depth. I'm just, you know, conscious of you can't not be aware of these kinds of tropes and ideas about um, the Scots being barbaric from the perspective of the of English clerical writers and um, uh, uh, but um, I'm sorry, I'm not really qualified to give the more uh, a more detailed uh, answer than that. Oh, it, 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 it's interesting the way Susan that, that you know, these lectures and the questions after them spin off in in, in, in quite uh, unexpected uh, directions. Um, I, I never thought that a, um, a, a lecture on questions of legitimacy and illegitimacy illegitimacy and the succession in, in medieval gallery would end up in a discussion about you know um what having a beard or not having a beard um represented um it looks like questions are uh, coming to an end here 
um, naturally. So I think at that point, unless there's anything, uh, Susan, that you'd like to add by way of parting shot. Um, um, but, okay, thank you. That, so it's a pleasure to, to thank you um, once again um, for a really, really interesting, stimulating talk. Um, and you know, it's got me thinking about a few more um, aspects if I ever do come back uh, to we look do. at gallery again. <laughs> mm, I'm an environmental historian now. Um, and without much further ado, say thank you, uh, and we'll give you uh, a virtual um, clap to uh, to show our appreciation.